I love you. Thank you for joining us, all you good-looking people. Two that I see right now, very good-looking, very good-looking. I, I have to show you something. Dr. Dave is sitting right next to me. He gave, on Sunday, my opinion, one of the best messages he's ever given. But to open the message, he had a story. And the story was about this bird that you're about to see on the screen. It's a sand crane, right? Sand hill crane. Sand hill, okay. Sand hill crane. There's another one. Take a look, Dave. Have you mm -hmm. seen those birds lately? Yes. <laughs> okay. Take it. Take a look at this one, because he's. I, I I love these pictures. Look at. And there's the there's the red hat, <laughs> and and David opened his message <clears throat> with a look at that, look at Dave look at this one. Oh yeah, I know him. <laughs> I've seen him. He knows me, and and it was the most amazing. I've never heard one even close to this one, but I had those pictures to kind of have you in your mind picture what Dave is about to tell us. All right, well, I'm, on, I'm out for a walk, and I come up on three of the Sand Hill Cranes who are in the middle of the sidewalk. I'm walking towards them. Now, I'm wearing all gray with a red baseball cap, so I slow down to see how close I can get. I'm in about 10 feet away from them when I remember I have on my phone a recording. Can I play the call? Sure, yeah. All right. Put, hold it up to your mic. And I remembered I had this call on my phone, so I pulled it out and I played this. As they were coming to you? As they are just... Well, as this is playing, they stand straight up, their heads are looking around to see who's calling them, and then when it stops, they look at me and they come walking over to me. And they come right up to me where I could have put my arm around all three of them, and they threw back their heads and started calling like that. And that... That call that I just played isn't the full volume. It, the, their call is very loud. So all three of them were just um, singing their song. And, and you I, had your red cap I had on, my red cap just on, like their and cap. I threw my head back, and I was a crane. So they thought you were one of them. I was, I was, I was their granddad. I was singing with them. So, so, so how, how did that, give me that scenario, how did that feel? Well, it was a, a, a euphoric feeling uh, to, to feel like these uh, cranes had accepted me as one of them. And then when they got done doing their call, they, they flapped their wings, and I, I bent, and they flew right over my head, and I got the feeling they were saying, let's go, let's, let's go to the and next And they wanted spot. you to join and them. And they wanted me to join them. And, uh, but, but what was funny was you weren't sure that that recording was... Yes, they have a... You, it could have been a mating. <laughs> a mating call or what they call the mobbing call. <laughs> The mobbing call is when they're telling the other Sand Hill Cranes, Attack. somebody is attacking us, come help me wow. get rid of this. So I didn't know which call I just played, so I was a little apprehensive <laughs> until they, they so flew away. I just had to share that with you. And by the way, i got something else to share, Dave. You'll, you'll be interested in this. Uh, this guy has stopped watching our program because he, until he loses those glasses, meaning the, apparently the white ones, <laughs> uh, I'm serious. He is on some new medication. <laughs> uh, has he been watching Elton John videos? I'm serious. I will pray for new glasses for him. Poor Sharon. Give her my <laughs> condolences. I'm serious. Exclamation all of them. God bless you guys. Goodbye, Herman. I love you, man. Hate those glasses. I'm really serious. Really. <laughs> so, so, we, so we have different viewers out there that have some really spiritual depth, Dave. You know, if they stop watching Bible programs because of a pair of glasses. People would leave church over those glasses. Yeah. And colors of rugs, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to get back to talking about heaven. And I have some things that you will see on the screen. Dave is going to have some references that hopefully as you open your Bible, remember, when you start this program, you have your Bible, your pencil, and hopefully a pad. It's great to just take down some of the references and go back to them after the program and in depth start studying the Word of God. That's what this program is all about. It is amazing how many people, I had a person come to me in Sarasota the other day, we were down there in a Bob Evans restaurant and this guy was from 
uh, Scotland. And he said, I set my clock at 5 o'clock every Friday. Uh, and, he, and he said, I'm going back to Maryland. And I said, well, do you have a dish, uh, uh, you know, so that you get, I said, we're on Dish TV. And he goes, really? Yes, I have Dish. So he's going to oh, be good. watching in Maryland. So it's amazing the response of people that enjoy getting in the Word of God and hearing a teacher that lets the Word of God say what it says. I won't go any further. Dave, put some of these up on, this is part three, by the way, uh, on the subject of heaven. And we will we'll start with some of the, uh, uh, yes, quotes. Uh, here we go. Some of the quotes. Uh, we are ready to go. As I'm talking, he's getting ready for it because these are all computerized. And, now these are all from Randy Alcorn's book, yes, Heaven. Yes, and, and by the way, uh, I'll tell you how you can get your copy during this show and the second part of our show because it is imperative, and I say that again, imperative that you get a copy of this book. It is, I'm, I'm reading it the second time. Dave, who has this enormous brain, can read something one time and he's got it. Okay? Well, I wasn't born that way. When Christians die, we enter an intermediate stage, or state, a transitional period our future resurrection to life on the new earth. In other words, it's not our final destination. Is that right? Yes, uh, with, with certain explanations to it. Okay, give it. When we, when we die, we don't go into the coffin and sleep in the coffin in a confined environment until the resurrection. We go to Abraham's bosom. In Luke 16, where the rich man dies and the beggar dies, and the beggar is carried by angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man dies, and he goes to hell. And there's this conversation between the rich man and uh, Abraham, where he says, Father Abraham, send somebody to dip their finger in water and, and put up my tongue. And Abraham says, I cannot do that. Then he asks Abraham to send somebody to tell my brothers that this is all real. Well, the, the believer, the leper, who, the beggar who died, went to a place. He didn't go just into the ground and sleep. He went to a, a, an intermediate heaven where Christ is. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but it's not in our ultimate destination. It's in a, it's in a uh, transitional heaven because a new heaven and a new earth is still being made and yet to be revealed. So we go to Abraham's bosom or paradise would be an Old Testament word, and there we wait for the resurrection to this new heaven and new earth. Next one on your screen. Uh, when we die, believers in Christ will not go to the heaven where we'll live forever. Instead, we will go to an intermediate heaven. And that's sort of what we just talked okay. about. The, uh, expand on that the, because the place I, think, the, I think we as Christians, we hear so little about heaven and so much about this earth, yes. about how rich we can be how many cars we can have, how many homes we have, and how big they can be, right? And and how many glasses we can own. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't hear a whole lot from the pulpit about heaven, and we're only here 70 to 80, sometimes 90, sometimes like uh, George Beverly Shea, 104. But we are going to die, and if we know Christ as Savior, heaven is our destination for all eternity. Yes. And so there's very little taught about that. So, Dave, put that back on the screen so we can kind of, again, uh, put that in our mind. When we die, believers in Christ will not go to the heaven where we'll live forever. Instead, we'll go to an intermediate heaven. Okay, now, to a lot of people, that's like new theology. Yeah, and it's not purgatory, and right. it's not limbo, yep. which is a, a, a non-biblical concepts. This is a place of the dead, Sheol, called in the Old Testament, where the dead go, and they go in this place to one of two places, what we would call Hades or hell or paradise, and they are separated by a great gulf. You, they can't cross over. You go to one of these two places awaiting the great day of resurrection. Believers to go to the eternal heaven, unbelievers to come to the great white throne judgment to which they'll go to the lake of fire. Both of these places are very similar to the ultimate destination, just not to the same scope or same degree. That rich man who died in Luke 16, uh, he is in burning fire, but he's in hell. 
He's in Hades. He's not in the lake of fire yet. Now that's debated too, similar. whether it's fire. Well, whether it's literal fire or the pain is literal, it's the pain that fire would bring. That's for sure. Uh, when, when he gives that analogy or that portrayal of hell being flames and pain, he's describing a pain that is the most excruciating probably humans can suffer to let you know that hell is that painful. So they can argue whether or not it's literal flame or not. The pain is literal. The suffering is literal. And that's what you should take from that. But let's say because that is not the lake of fire, but the suffering is very similar, the same thing is true about paradise. It's not the ultimate heaven, but it's very similar. It's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place to go. But we're waiting to be called to the home that Christ is building for us that he mentions in John 14. The next one on the screen, Dave. Uh, will awake the time of Christ's return. Will await, rather. Will await the time of Christ's return to the earth. Our bodily resurrection, the final judgment, and the creation of the new heaven and new earth. Yes, there are some things that still have to happen in the prophetic calendar. It's one of the reasons why we know um, the Antichrist is not here yet. Those of us who are pre-tribulational rapturists, who believe that the Lord will rapture out the church before the appearance of the Antichrist, well, whatever people might think of Obama or Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler or Stalin or anybody else in the world uh, who's even alive today, uh, the rapture hasn't happened yet. So we know there's some things that have to take place before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know the day or the time, but we do know before Jesus comes back, the Antichrist has to appear. So we know Christ is not coming back today because the Antichrist is not here. Now, that doesn't mean the rapture. I'm talking about the second coming. Well, the same thing is true about going to heaven. There are some things that have to happen still that haven't happened yet. So if you and I were to die today, the new heaven and the new earth have not been revealed yet. The marriage supper of the Lamb has not taken place yet. We have not been granted our white robes to wear yet. We have not come back in victory on horses yet with our conquering king. Those things haven't happened, so where do we go now? We go to this transitional heaven, intermediate heaven, paradise, Abraham's bosom, to await the unfolding of this calendar that will ultimately uh, end with the new heaven and new earth. Will we be judged when we die? Uh, not judged, assessed would be perhaps a, a better word. Okay. It's called the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat of Christ, where believers, their works are assessed. Why the name Bema? It's a reference to uh, the Greek practices of the Olympic Games. Uh, Bema means uh, elevated platform. So it's really just the word for a, an elevated platform, which is like uh, in our Olympics today, you have that one level, yeah. bronze medal, yeah. silver medal, and gold medal is elevated. So it's the Bema seat of Christ where your works are assessed and you are granted the rewards for your works. It's not a place of punitive action. That's the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is the Bema seat where your works are judged for their value or their significance or their purity. Uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, you mentioned that. Yes. I've got some notes here so I don't forget because, you know, off the top of my head and then after the program I go, boy, I wish I would have asked that. So I'm putting them down. The marriage supper of the Lamb, what is that, the significance of that? Well, the significance of it, it is the fulfillment of uh, both Old Testament and New Testament theology. In the Old Testament, Israel is presented as being betrothed or married to God. And God refers to their idolatry uh, constantly in the Old Testament as adultery. That they are, they are adulterous servants. They are adulterous children. He doesn't mean they're committing adultery with each other. He's saying they are being adulterous to Him. They are not being faithful to Him. Yeah, wow. So in Hosea, the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea to go marry a prostitute named Gomer. And he, he tells him to do that because he's going to use Hosea's marriage as an example to Israel. You are adulterous. You are my bride and you're being adulterous. So it's an Old Testament idea, but it's also a New Testament idea. When Paul talks about marriage in Ephesians 5, when he gets done talking about the elements of marriage, he then says, but I speak about a mystery concerning Christ and the church. So we are the bride of Christ and He is our groom 
who was one day we we're going to be married to him and not in the same sense marriages are today but in the same sense of unity and um, and binding and it's referred to in Revelation chapter 19 where this great marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in which we are, are married to Christ as his co-regents uh, in heaven and it's an analogy to the Middle Eastern uh, practices of marriage of that day. Now, our thinking is attached to what we've seen here. How will that transition to what you just talked about? In other words, totally different or similar to what we've seen here in, in big banquets, big marriages, uh, you know, we've seen gala marriages and we've seen small ones, but right. how does that relate? Well, there are, there are many things on earth that are reflections of what is already true in heaven. And marriage is one of those. God doesn't come up with marriage because we can understand it. The marriage in heaven was declared before God made the world. He put human relationships and instituted marriage on earth to be a reminder, to be a reflector of the eternal truth that someday man will be married to his son in some uh, mystical um, spiritual union that marriage is the best portrayal of it. But what he does do, he uses the Middle Eastern practice of fantastic, spectacular weddings as a portrayal of what's going to take place in heaven and Christ's love for us. In John 14, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and get you uh, and take you to where I am, that is a reference to a very well-known practice of the day, which was the Middle Eastern marriage, in which the husband and the wife might meet on the day of betrothal. The parents would have arranged it. The groom would come and give her a, an earnest and say, now I'm going to leave and go make a home for us. And he would leave and go make a home. It could be on his father's house. It could be on the father's property. He'd build a home. Unannounced to the wife, she would know it would be sometime within a year, he would be coming back. She was to always be ready for his return. When he would come, his friends would blow the trumpets and say, the groom is here and she is to have her wedding party ready. He would take her, bring her back to the home where they would have the marriage supper they would consummate the uh, marriage and then the supper would follow and the father's wealth was demonstrated in the length of the marriage supper. So John 14, 1 through 3 is a reference to this marriage supper. John 19 is a reference to the point that most scholars believe, conservative evangelical scholars, that the marriage supper is the thousand year reign of Christ. That's what the, a thousand year marriage supper to reflect the wealth and grandeur of the Heavenly Father. Believers and unbelievers face a final judgment. Okay, so both. Tell us the difference. With you different, alluded to it. With different intent. The believers in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, can I yes, read that absolutely. verse? absolutely. It says, Therefore we make it our reign, this is Paul talking, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. That's the ultimate aim of believer, is to please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat or bema seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now that's the reference to this bema seat, what we will receive for good deeds. That's believers. That's believers. And it's important to know the uh, designation of the word bad there. It doesn't mean moral evil. It means useless or worthless or of no value. Because what the Bema Seat is, is taking the works of the believer and as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, trying them by fire to see what comes out as pure gold. And that becomes what we receive our rewards for. The judgment of the believer is not about punishment. It's not about retribution. It's about our, rewards? our works being assessed okay. for the distribution of rewards. The great white throne judgment, where unbelievers go, has nothing to do with rewards. It is retribution. It is punishment for the sin of rejecting the Savior. And in, in Revelation chapter 20, when the Bible talks about the great white throne judgment, and which I think we'll get to maybe next week, yes. it's very specific as to what happens, and there's only one outcome. It's the outcome of the lake of fire. So there is a first judgment and a final judgment. There's a final judgment for both of us. Ours is the Bema Seat. 
unbelievers is the great white throne judgment. We only have one judgment, believers. It's the Bema Seat of Christ, in which our works are assessed for the rewards we will receive. Not to see whether we'll go into heaven or not, but what kind of rewards we will receive. And then the Bible hints in Revelation 20 what we're going to do with these rewards, the five crowns, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the faithfulness crown, the purity crown. We're going to take them and throw them at Jesus' feet anyway. Wow. Wow. Uh, because we're not going to walk around assessing each other for how many jewels you have. It's God's honoring us in terms of the faith that He put in us, the work that He did through us. He will honor that at the Bema Seat and then we'll live forever with Christ. Our works do not affect our salvation. No, because we didn't get it by works. We don't enhance it by works either. And we don't maintain it by works. It's interesting that some denominations kind of teach that. Uh, it's that, a natural tendency that it's of man. A, that it's, it's almost how good you are and how good you remain determines if you're going to make it. Well, and, and it sneaks into all of our theology, to be honest with you. Even those of us who believe that you are saved by grace and you're saved by faith alone. After we're saved, we tend to live by works. <laughs> and we think that we maintain our relationship with Christ by works. Yeah. But our, our fellowship with Christ, our communion with Christ is affected by the faithfulness of our walk. But our relationship is declared by new birth. We don't get born again every day. You get born again one time. And then you are born again. You are a child of God. You might not be a very faithful child of God. You might be a child of God in rebellion. You might be a displeasing child of God. But if you're born into God's family, you are a child of God. What He then demands of us, we are to live our new life out to please Him. So, but sometimes we get that fuzzy and we as, as evangelicals can often think, well, you got to live good in order to please God. You got to live good to even get the chance to make it to heaven. You're going to get in there by the skin of your teeth. Uh, it's all by grace. We're saved by grace. We're maintained by grace. We're, we're always hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on in. And we get that in our head. And we say, am I close to that? So the works do create that kind of a lifestyle. Yes. Because the, we want to hear that. Our, our works have an effect on how much we please God. If those works are done by faith in complete submission to Him. Not the accomplishments, not the achievements, but um, like say for a single mother, uh, she's working three jobs trying to provide for her little children. Her act of service and devotion to God is to do that by faith. Wow. She may never preach a sermon, right. may never win anybody to Christ, but she's devoting her life to the welfare of her children in obedience to God's command on her life to be a mother. He's entrusted children to her. That takes faith. God will reward that faith. Wow, that's good so we, we please God by our yeah. faith, not by the, uh, the um, uh, elevation of our deeds. Let's go through some of the scriptures that you gave. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, this is not the fires of hell. This is the fires of God's purification, um, getting rid of the dross of wood, our Wood, hair, works. stubble. Wood, hair, stubble goes in, yeah. and we see what comes out. Yeah. And the wood, hair, stubble will be burned up. The faith that we've demonstrated will come out like gold. And so these are fires of purification, not of us and our sin, but of assessment and evaluation of our work. I was reading some places that they were asking this, this silversmith, well, he was boiling the silver, and the person said, how do you know when you are supposed to stop? I mean, how do you, and he says, when, you, when I can see my reflection, mm -hmm. all the dross is taken away. Yes. And that, that's a picture of, that's when all, all of our unrighteousness and everything, when we can see his face in the life that we now live, we are now reflecting Him. Yeah, the ultimate end of the Christian life is to be like Christ. Yes. And it's to reflect Christ through the fruit of the Spirit, the words of God, and the attitude of Christ. That's the ultimate end of Christianity. Wow. Not to build great churches, not to build great monuments, not to accomplish some great world-changing event. 
but to reflect Jesus because the Bible says it is God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Well, God doesn't have five million Billy Grahams out there. There was one Billy Graham. Yeah. Uh, what are the rest of us supposed to do? Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Whatever God says, yes. that's important. Yes. Yes. That's if true. God gives it to you, that's yep. important. Revelations 19. Um, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So this event in heaven is going to be of such magnitude that God is calling the angels. Wow. He's calling the four living creatures. He's calling the 24 elders to come as guests to the wedding. This is for the church of Jesus Christ. We are the bride allowed to dress in white to, be, uh, to have our betrothal fulfilled in marriage wow. to the Lamb. And it's going to be an extravagant event, uh, surpassing anything that we can imagine. Isaiah 43, read that and then just share Christ with somebody. We're out of time. Well, this is uh, God speaking to Israel and speaking to us through prophecy. I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. There's this wonderful gift of grace that God offers to anyone who will come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and that is the removal of your sins, the blotting out of your sins. And then Paul uh, further refines it in Romans where he says, you are declared righteous, Amen. you're justified. Amen. So not only are your sins blotted out, you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you all by faith, not faith in you, not faith in karma, not faith that everything will work out, but faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ yes. to the point that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes with the Father but by me. Your faith must be in who Jesus is, God the Son, and what Jesus is, did. He died on the cross and He rose from the dead. And if you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, He will blot out your sins. He will grant you righteousness. And you too will go to this wonderful place yes. called heaven for all of eternity with all your loved ones who believe in Jesus as well. Call upon Him. That's where you can spend all eternity. I can't fathom that. That the blessing that we're going to experience will never end. Trust Him and you have that to look forward to. God bless you. Bye-bye.